As a dental hygienist, we know that we're lifetime learners. Getting continuing education is not optional. So it's my responsibility to be as knowledgeable and valuable as possible, but there's the caveat. I think as the practice owner, it's your responsibility to take care of your baby, which is your practice. The dental hygienist market is very interesting because you have dentists who are competing to attract hygiene team members, hygienists, by paying them a lot. There's some markets it's crazy, right? Like over a hundred dollars in some markets an hour. I think it's actually good for the market and here's why. All right, we are live and this is a really, really interesting topic. And today we have a guest that's going to be able to help us with this because she's been a dental hygienist for 11 years and in the industry for over 20. And um, the topic is this, what's stopping offices from paying hygienists top dollar? So Katrina, could you give us could you give us your answer to that? Um, well, well, first, it's actually I'm in my 18th year of dental hygiene, which is crazy, oh. but um, that that has lended to a lot of experience. Um, 27 actually in dentistry. I started when I was 19, and oh, I wow. started in the front office. And um, what I feel like is after working the front office, I went to Delta Dental for five years. I'm in hygiene now for a lot of a lot of uh, years. I've done some hygiene consulting. I've, I've been around, right? And I think the thing that stops dental offices from offering their hygienist top dollar is not knowing whether or not that hygienist is going to practice comprehensive hygiene. And what I mean by comprehensive hygiene is, are they coming to work with just their basic license I got my little paper here that says I'm a qualified RDH. Yep. And therefore, so you're legal, um, you legally can work. That's it. Yes. Right? Yes. I'm just above dangerous <laughs> with my scalers. And, um, and, and then the question is from there, you know, it, 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 this is a business, you know, the business of dentistry scares a lot of hygienists because there's that pressure there. You have to perform and you have to do a quota and they're going to give you, you know, you're going to have this over demanding office manager really laying into you every day. Why didn't you do what you were supposed to do? And I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had uh, even dental assistants go back and review my charts and say, question me in a team meeting and say, why didn't you do a rest in this five millimeter pocket? Like, are you kidding me? So there's, there's always this battle, right? Of you're not doing enough. You need to do more. And I'm doing the best that I can. And then there's the, the other end of it where it's like, do you have the things that you need to perform clinical hygiene in a way that's going to best A, serve your patient and B, serve the practice and C, serve yourself. Because for me as a clinical hygienist, I didn't get into this to be just a pro female hygienist. I want to be the best hygienist I can be. So define Maybe. that for somebody so like a profi meal hygienist. Okay. So explain this to somebody like me. I'm non-clinical. I'm a marketing guy. What, okay. what exactly does that mean? So in dentistry, we have codes for different procedures that we do. The D110 is your standard cleaning. That means a, a patient who is healthy, that we don't have um, any subgingival involvement. So it's a basic, basic cleaning on a healthy patient. And so this is the easiest procedure to bill in the practice. This is the one that the dental insurances typically reimburse by like $30 or something really, really minuscule. It does not benefit the practice at all. It's really the loss leader that dental hygiene has always been known for being. And so, you know, a lot of the times a patient will come in, they just want their free cleaning. They want the minimum. I just want a cleaning. And so we're trying in dentistry to, to evolve from this. We're not doing cleanings. We're doing maintenance, we're doing periodontal maintenance or periodontal therapy or whatever it is that we're doing that is beyond just a cleaning. We're not just two scrapers. We shouldn't be. We deserve to be better than that, right? Like yeah. it's 2024. When you know better, so, do better. Yeah. So, so there's, there are, but there are hygienists out there that are like that, right? So they're coming out of school and they just don't know what they don't know. So someone has to teach them, right? So it's very similar. I would re relate it to the doctors that are coming out of school right now. The dentists are coming out of school. They don't have the training. They don't know. No one showed them how to do certain things. So who does that responsibility fall on? Does this fall on the doctors? Does this fall on the hygienist? How, like where, where do you see this going? Like where, where, where does the responsibility actually fall? I love this question. So I'm going to say it's a mutual responsibility because as a dental hygienist, 
we know that we're lifetime learners. Getting continuing education is not optional. So we choose how much extra education we get. I can tell you that I've been laser certified for over 13 years. I've taken occlusal therapy courses. I've gone and done sleep dentistry for dental hygienists. I mean, I'm certified in everything under the sun except for probably myofunctional therapy, which I have an interest in and will do. Um, But so that's on me. I want to further my education and make myself valuable, right? Because it's not just getting in there, doing a cleaning and leaving my operatory and then leaving the mess for everyone else. It's also, can I go in and anesthetize for the doctor if they're running behind? Can I go in and make a temporary? Can I go and answer the front desk phone and be valuable up there not just fumble around and say, hi, this is Katrina. Can you hold please? Like, can I be a valuable team member all the way around where needed? And so it's my responsibility to be as knowledgeable and valuable as possible, but there's the caveat. I think as the practice owner, It's your responsibility to take care of your baby, which is your practice. And so take your staff to your CEs. If you want to work your practice into being, say, um, an Invisalign provider, you've decided that that's the direction you want to go in, take your class to the CE courses that you're taking that make you fall in love with that that modality. If you want to be an implant specialist, take your, your staff there so they can get on fire about it. They can learn what you're learning. You can all have the same message and same perspective. Go back later and say, what did we learn? What did we like about it? What did we not like about it? And then as a team, you grow together. Mm -hmm. So you want your team to be on fire about something? Do it with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not talking pizza parties. That's that's not the thing. (laughs) So, okay. So I got a question. I got a question for you. So if, so right now the, the, the dental hygienist market is very interesting because you have dentists who are competing to attract hygiene team members, hygienists, by paying them a lot. There's some markets, it's crazy, right? Like over $100 in some markets an hour. And does that, does, is that good for the industry? Like, yeah, we're making more money or is it bad because the high talent people want to be in a consistent environment and they like where they work. And then it's kind of the middle bottle, middle people that end up bouncing around everywhere competing for top dollar. What, what, What are your thoughts on that? Where do you fall on that? Um, I think that it's very dependent. I think it's actually good for the market. And and here's why. If you walk into an office and you say, I want a hundred bucks an hour. um, If you don't perform that way, if you don't have that extra knowledge and take that into the operatory and work that way, you're not going to be a valuable, a value to that practice. And they're not going to keep you. Um, When I graduated in 2007, the recession happened, the, the housing crisis happened, all this stuff. I, did, I didn't have the job that I had lined up for me in hygiene school, right? It was not there. So you had to, like, we lost benefits, we lost hours, we lost jobs, all the things. The economy swings back the other way, which is where we are now. And, you know, you can demand all you want, but when it goes back the other way, those people that practice comprehensive hygiene, they talk to their patients about all the adjunct therapies, they make their value known those people are going to keep their jobs. They're going to make sure that, I mean, if you're, if you're asking a hundred bucks an hour and you're producing, you know, $3,000 a day, that dentist doesn't care because he's making his money because he can make his practice work and his patients are getting the best care possible. Right. And, and that's ultimately what it comes down to. Now, can you do that in a, um, non fee for service practice. That's, that's the issue. Okay. Now I want you to play devil's advocate. So what are the risks? Let's pretend you're the owner doctor. So you own a practice and you're the dentist. What are the downsides of paying hygienists a lot of money? Like where, where, where are the pitfalls that people should be like, you know what, here's where you need to be aware of that. You, from a hygienist perspective, you need to be cautious of these things. Yeah. That's like kind of what I was just saying. Like, if you don't produce your value, you're not going to stay. So as a okay, hygienist. But, but so, so yes, I, I agree with that. Right. So you got to produce the value, but sometimes the value alignment, and we kind of touched on this earlier. Sometimes the value alignment of a hygienist is different than the value that the doctor is looking at. Right. And those yeah. two things don't always align where the hygienist is like, no, 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 I'm crushing it. I saw this many people. And the doctor's like, no, that's not just what I'm looking for. There's other yeah. things that I'm looking for as well. So how, how would you navigate that? I, it's probably second nature to you because you've been doing it so long. You're a hygienist, but let's pretend you're a dentist now and you're not a hygienist, but you still have all your knowledge. How would you 
how would you sort through that as, as a doctor? So the first thing that I would do is make sure that that vetting process is extremely thorough. I would make sure that there's a probationary period that would make sure that our philosophies align. And this is something that I talk a lot about in my career longevity course. Um, if I'm a dentist and I want to focus on uh, Invisalign, we're just going to use that as an example. I'm going to make sure that in that interview process, I find out what that hygienist perspective is, what their philosophy is on Invisalign. Uh, so, so maybe they're like, yeah, so they might say, I think clear liners are horrible and they don't help you clinically. Um, they're just cosmetic. Then that's not going to be a good fit for your office, right? Right. Yeah. Your philosophies need to align. I have personally had to go out when I was, when I'm looking for positions and I put in my, my advertisement per se, I want an office that talks about adult ortho. I want to do laser therapy. I want to do sleep medicine. I'm going to talk about these things with your patients. So if I'm not the one for you, that's okay, but let's know this up front. And I think that that's important to have that conversation on both ends. If I'm a dentist and my head, my hygienist is not doing oral cancer screenings, we're not going to be in alignment. We're not going to be in alignment if we don't, if she's unwilling or he's unwilling to take a sleep hygiene course. Because so maybe, so maybe a red flag is that the hygienist doesn't give you their opinion on any of these things, right? Like if the hygienist is just like, whatever, I'm just here to do hygiene, you know, whatever you want, doc, that's possibly a red flag because yeah. they're not, they don't, they haven't even been doing this long enough or they don't care enough to actually build an opinion on these things. Yes. Or if, you know, in that, and I think this is where in-person interviews are still incredibly, incredibly important because you can read people when they're sitting in front of you and you say, are you willing to go get sleep certified for a, for a dental hygienist? And their, their body language is going to tell you, mm, not sure about that. Or, you know, maybe if it's a maybe conversation is done. Because that means that they really don't want to. They want the job. They want a job. They want to make good money. Um, and and as if I were a dentist, I would be doing that. I would be offering good money because I want long term staff. Uh, and that to me, that's that's valuable. Patients come and they spend a lot of time with the hygienist and about five minutes with the doctor. Hopefully, if if all is yeah. well, we need to be so in line with one another that like I start sentences and you finish them. And I not, I set it up, you knock it down. That's the way it should be. And if you don't have that alignment with your staff, it's not going to work. Okay. So I, I love that. That's a great, that's a great tip and very thoughtful. Um, what are now, what's the business side? So now you're, you're the owner doctor. You're, you're going to hire this hygienist and you're paying them a ton of money per hour and you line, you guys are on the same page. How are you going to make sure that this works from a business standpoint? I know clinically you got to make sure you're doing honest. You're, everything's honest. Everything's above board. What, what things are you looking from a business side, either KPIs or like different things like that, that to make sure that you're going to be successful because you are paying top dollar. So the first thing is providing the means to do those things. If I want my hygienist to do laser therapy, I'm going to make sure she has her own individual laser in her room. Because then I can say, I'm giving you the laser to do. You don't have to go fetch it from another operatory. You don't have to drag it out of a drawer. It's right there. It's accessible. It's easy. I'm going to make sure they have all the things they need um, in order to do it. I'm going to give them adequate enough time. I mean, essentially, it's, it's kind of like parenting. You know, you give the kid enough rope. Here you go. And if you're not going to do it, and I, I see the day sheet, I know what you're, you're doing every day. I know what you're producing. I'm asking the patients at the end of the day or at the end of their visit, how was your visit? I know whether the patients like you, where is, you know, if the numbers are not matching, let's have a conversation. What's not occurring? Where's your objection? Let's work on training, how we can overcome these objections. How can we better educate people and go from there? Because if, if I'm not, you know, what do they say? You inspect what you expect. Yeah. You look yeah, at yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's a really good point. Okay. I got it. I'm going to change gears on you a little bit. Um, and this is an area that I always get super confused on. And I imagine this might be something that you would, you would know like really well is what are, how do you approach all these different markets? So each state seems to have different rules. There are a lot of different rules for hygienists. So I hear different things where, well, no, our hygienists do this and it's great. It's very profitable for us. And I'm like, wait, dental hygienists are allowed to do that. Oh, no, no, no. Only in that state, they're allowed to do that, but they're not allowed to do it in this state. Could you give us just 
like the rundown of like how you see different markets, like who's doing it right and who's maybe not doing it right? Ooh, I'm going to get fired for this one or I'm going to be set on <laughs> fire for this one. Yeah, um, that's what I'm so talking about. Th- there are different, there's definitely different models. You know, there's the assisted hygiene model where you, you basically have a, a scaling machine monkey at, in the operatory, you know, hoping to get enough, um, you know, scaling done and time educating the patient. Maybe I'm, that's, that's theoretical. Um, so you get twice as many D one one ones, um, you know, build, you, you get enough profies build and try to make that bottom line work that way. Um, and then there's the other idea that you maximize the scope of the hygienist, which is what kind of you're leaning towards, I think, with that question on what they can do. Now, being a California hygienist, I can do all kinds of things. You know, our scope is pretty much almost unlimited apart from Washington hygienists that can place restorations. Uh, so how can you best maximize your hygienist using all those things that we can do, expanding and using our scope of the things that we can do. Now, does that mean eliminating things that other people can do like polishing and flossing that assistants can do? I don't think so. Um, I think those are things that um, have a lot of room for education and relationship building for patients. That's the time when you go back through and you check your work, you, you look for missing uh, pieces of, of debris and whatnot. But that's also time to really talk about things like their whole body health, um, look for areas of restorations that might be faulty. That That's time. And, you know, time is our most valuable resource in the hygiene operatory. That's the reason truly why we have so much of it is because we are the detectors of the office. That's really our best utilization. You know, just about anybody, if taught, can pick up a scaler and, and get debris off of teeth. That's that's the least important thing that we do, if you think about it. I mean, yeah. it's it's the thing that point. they're being billed for. It's the, yeah, it's the billable course. procedure. <laughs> but it's definitely not where you find, um, you know, broken restorations. It's not where you find opportunities to talk about Invisalign. It's not where you talk about their dry mouth syndrome. You know, there's just so much more and you need that time. Do you want to practice comprehensive whole body hygiene or do you want to be a pro female? Mm, That's really good. All right. So now this is your time to talk a little bit about yourself and your background. What, how'd you learn all this stuff? I know you've been in the industry for a long time, but like how, how did you build out these opinions and this understanding? Uh, So the beauty of starting off in the front desk is I, I knew that I wanted to be a hygienist right out the gate and I learned, you know, dental jargon and I, I, learned about insurance and I was billing insurance and then eventually left the front desk because I couldn't stand being yelled at every day and everything was my fault. You know, the the schedule's too full. It's your fault. The schedule's not full. It's your fault. And somebody's paying or not paying. That's your fault. I mean, I have so much um, props for those people that can do that job long-term. That's not my gift. Uh, So I did that. And then I left for Delta Dental where I learned a lot about the insurance side of it. I learned a lot about ergonomics Um, And I I met a lot of dentists who had retired uh, from disability, but they could still use their knowledge to work with claims and such like that. So I've just spent a lot of time. I'm a dental nerd. I I mean, there's just really no way around it. I I take probably 100 hours of CE every year. I am neck deep in all things dental. It it just lights my fire. And That's then so I, awesome. I got into ergonomic coaching and um, I did some hygiene coaching because I love it so much. I thought, you know, we're really, we're really battling the wrong thing when we look at billing procedure codes as the, we're, we're clinging to this profi code as if it's our life support. And it's really just the smallest thing that we do. Mm. I love, and it's I love the that. thing no, that our I patients love- value the least. I, I love that. I love the way you broke that down. And I, I love the different point of view on that because that's not the conversation that people are. Having. And I think that's, I think that's crucial. If you're going to, if you're going to change something, you got to change people's perspective and it starts at what the root of it, right? Like the bottom line of what something actually is. And if you start with a faulty premise, then it's going to give you a faulty look on it. And if you change the premise, like you did there, um, then it totally changes everybody's opinion on it. So that, that's that been really, really good. I learned a lot in this. I appreciate you coming on. What's the best way for somebody to reach out and get in contact with you? 
So I'm all over social media, <laughs> for one. Um, so you can friend me on Facebook. That's fine. I, I'll friend anybody with a real profile picture that's in, in my circles. <laughs> um, Ergo Fit Life is my company. I focus on ergonomics and, and posture correction fitness and lifestyle wellness, career longevity. I, I'm a speaker, so I am all over the country speaking. I do team training for ergonomics. So if you go to ergofitlife.com, you're going to find my website. If you go onto Instagram, I'm at, at ergofitlife underscore Katrina. And if you really want to have some fun, you can get into my Facebook page or group, which is Ergo Fit Life, where I give lots of free daily tips on all things ergonomics, posture, wellness, nutrition, motivation, all those hearts and flowers, fuzzy, warm feeling things. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. You did a great job. I learned a lot from this. I know our audience is going to think through this a little bit differently. And uh, I just really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge with the world. Thank you so much for the invite.